You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. I used to hate going to garage sales and thrift stores when I was a kid. That did not stop my family from dragging me through every single one that they could find. Now that I'm older, I can totally understand the joy in finding the treasures in the second hand. I get the thrill in finding exactly what you had in mind when it was the overlooked of someone else, or the excitement of finding something name brand or extremely rare. But something most people rifling through bargain bins and online auctions everywhere don't ever think about is the history and the energy attached to the item in question. What has that mirror seen and soaked up? Were those coins in the pocket of a dying soldier? Was that hunting knife used for something else? What darkness does that doll contain? Is it housing an entity? Is it intelligent? Is it biding its time, waiting until you've placed it in your daughter's sleeping arms and you've left the room to turn its little head and give her a quick, play with me? Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl Podcast. I am your host, Kristen. Today we are doing our final episode on infestation. This time it is all about the possession of objects. While some folks out there don't want a thing to do with haunted items, some people cannot seem to be able to help themselves, collecting and hoarding them away, or putting them on display and selling you the opportunity to also feel nauseous while looking at their demonically inclined collection of dolls and masks, Zach Baggins. Haunted Museum in Las Vegas hosts some notably possessed possessions in its more than 30 rooms, including Bella Lugosi's Mirror, Peggy the doll, and possibly his most infamous diabolical possession, the Dybbuk box. The Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut also houses a good collection of haunted objects. Their most famous possession is, of course, the Raggedy Ann doll that Lorraine at one time labeled as evil. Her name is Annabelle, and she sits safely sealed behind blessed glass. Along with this most famous resident is kept a very evil and haunted pearl necklace, rumored to have been ripped from a woman's neck to keep it from choking her. They also have a decorated and painted real human skull said to have been used during satanic rituals, and numerous possessed dolls, masks, African statues, and knickknacks of varying levels of darkness and evil. If you had been fortunate enough to visit this place of oddities collected and run by the most famous medium and demonologist duo in the world prior to its closure in 2019, you were very lucky. It remains closed to the public to this day. So, you can't go to the Warrens' place. Let's say for argument's sake you can't make it to Las Vegas. Where else is a person supposed to go if they got an itch that can only be scratched by the presence of a demonically possessed object? eBay, of course. Tired of being creeped out by dolls that aren't haunted? Want to spruce up those blank walls but need that extra thrill of the diabolical evident in your artwork? Come on down to Haunted eBay. Oh, we've got possessed dolls and paintings, sure. But did you know that we also have possessed shoes, books, figurines, coins, and teddy bears? Is your wife's birthday coming up? Your anniversary? Valentine's Day? Get the romantic in your life who loves making their very existence a horror film their very own Dybbuk box. What's inside it? You mean, aside from the trapped demon? We don't know. It's the most thoughtful gift you'll never actually use. Did we mention the haunted dolls and paintings? So come on down to the haunted side of eBay. Buyer way. So, I just plugged in the word haunted into eBay's search bar, and it brought up 180,000 plus results. A quick scroll through is showing a lot of dolls, a few collectible 
kitschy, you know, manufactured stuff. But for the most part, it's actual items being sold supposedly as vessels for spirits or demonic entities. One of the most disturbing and notorious possessed objects sold in the online auction is a painting called The Hands Resist Him. The artist, Bill Stoneham, based the painting around an actual photograph taken of himself when he was just five. The painting depicts a young boy standing next to a doll in front of a glass door. Behind the boy, you can see all of these handprints on the glass. The article I'm looking at right now describes it saying disembodied hands in the background, but I I don't know. They, They look like handprints to me, which, you know what, makes it even spookier in my opinion. Anyway, the story goes, after its first public showing, three of the people with the closest attachments to the painting all died over the course of a six year time period. The original gallery owner, the person who bought the painting, and the art critic who gave it its first review. Then this thing disappeared for 26 years. Apparently, there was a couple in California who says that they found it in an abandoned brewery and they took it home. But not long after rescuing it, they listed it on eBay with a warning. This painting may or may not possess supernatural powers that could impact or change your life. Hmm. The couple claimed that their daughter had told them that the boy and girl in the painting would fight with each other at night and that one time the boy seemed to exit the painting. Fun. Some folks who have viewed the artwork have claimed to become physically ill or repulsed after viewing it. As of 2016, it was sitting in a Michigan gallery. Zach Baggins had at one time offered to buy the painting and for whatever reason, wasn't able to obtain it. When this was brought to the attention of the artist, Mr. Stoneham offered to paint the prequel of the painting for him. That one is called The Hands Invent Him and currently sits in Zach's museum today. Another famous eBay possessed item is the Dybbuk box, of course. This one has an interesting and convincing story and a twist at the end, so hang on to your hats. So, the man selling it said that he'd originally purchased the box at an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. He got to talking with the granddaughter of the deceased, who told him how her grandmother had spent time in a Nazi concentration camp during the war, and after escaping, she lived in Spain until the war ended. She purchased the Dybbuk box while there and brought it with her when she immigrated. As a child, the granddaughter recounted how her grandmother used to call it a Dybbuk box, though she didn't know what that meant. She was told under no circumstances was the box ever to be opened. The grandmother even asked to be buried with it, but unfortunately her request was not honored and it went into the estate sale following her death. So the guy took the box to his furniture refinishing business, intending to refinish it and give it to his mother. He says he put it in the basement and then opened the shop for the day like usual. He left at some point to run errands, but about a half hour later received a call from his salesperson who was screaming hysterically over the phone that someone was in the workshop breaking glass and swearing. The intruder had locked the security gates and the emergency exit too, and his worker said she couldn't get out of the store. His phone died as he told her to call the police. He raced back to the shop to find the gates locked, as his employee had said, and her sobbing hysterically on the floor. Upon investigating the basement workshop, he says he was hit by an unmistakable odor of cat urine, which, according to him, would have had no explanation whatsoever. When he went to flip the switch, the lights wouldn't come on. He realized as he edged into the space, as he stepped over broken glass, all of the bulbs in the basement had been broken. After searching, he would find no intruder. His worker would never return to work for him and refused to discuss whatever it was that happened that day. At that point, he didn't even think a connection to the box was in the realm of possibility. A couple of weeks later, he went to start working on refinishing it and opened it up. The items he found inside seemed maybe of sentimental value, but fairly harmless. A couple of wheat pennies, some locks of hair, a small statue with Hebrew letters gilded onto it, um, a, a dried rosebud, a wine cup, and an iron candlestick holder. Fast forward to just around his mom's birthday. She comes to the shop and he gifts her the cabinet. While she was examining it, he stepped away to make a phone call and hadn't been gone more than five minutes when one of his employees raced out saying something was wrong with his mother. He went back in to find her sitting expressionless with tears streaming down her face. She was totally non-responsive and he called an ambulance. Turns out she'd had a stroke. 
She ended up with partial paralysis and lost her ability to speak or form words, though she could still understand things being said to her. She would communicate by pointing to letters of the alphabet to spell out the words. He says when he asked her the following day how she was, she teared up and spelled out the words, no gift. He thought she was just misremembering and thought that he hadn't given her something for her birthday. After he reassured her he had, she became very upset and spelled out the words, hate gift. He laughed it off and promised to buy her something she actually liked as soon as she was better. He says he still didn't associate anything strange with the box. He would end up trying to rehome it to numerous people in his family, all of whom gave it back after only a day or two for one reason or another. He ended up selling it to a couple in his store, but found it sitting at his front doors a couple days later with a note that read, this has a bad darkness. He says he didn't know what that meant and ended up taking it home. He says he started having this strange recurring nightmare the day he brought it into his house of a gruesome, demonic-looking hag that would beat him up. He awoke numerous times after nights of having had this nightmare to find mysterious bruises and marks all over. Come to find out, after having some family stay over at his home, that everyone ended up having the nightmare of the old hag who beat them up and claimed the same thing had happened when they each individually had taken it off the guy's hands in an attempt to rehome it earlier. As they talked, they realized the common denominator, the only connecting aspect, was having this cabinet in such intimate vicinity in their homes. So after the cat was out of the bag about the box, the man claimed that it seemed like everything kicked up a notch, as for a week after that family discussion, he described seeing shadowy things moving out of the corner of his eye. He ended up moving the cabinet to an outdoor storage unit and was awakened in the middle of the night by the fire alarm going off. When he went to investigate, there was no fire, but he was once again hit with that smell of cat urine. He would have the same nightmare he always did once more, but the final time awake to the feeling of breathing on his neck and look to see a giant shadowy being loping down the hallway away from him. The original seller then ends his online description and story by saying he was afraid to destroy the cabinet, not knowing what it was that he was actually dealing with, and having whatever it was that was attached to it end up attaching itself to his home. His effort to sell it to someone on eBay was specifically because he knew that collectors of these types of things often look for them on that website. Pretty strange story, would you agree? According to the person who ended up buying from the original seller after doing the research, they found that a dybbuk from Jewish folklore and mythology could mean a misplaced spirit that can neither rise to heaven nor descend to hell, basically stuck. Another definition they provided was that the dybbuk was a demon that enters the body of a living person and controls that body's behaviors. Sounds like possession exactly. Doesn't explain the possession of a box, though. Anyway, at some point after this... We know that Zach Baggins took ownership of this box. He had a very famous episode surrounding it and Post Malone, and that is where it sits even now. So something kind of interesting, Missed an Orb Society on Instagram brought this to my attention. There was a Jewish rabbi on the Ghost Adventures show who came on and had no idea what they were talking about, had never heard of the Dybbuk box. This information does go hand in hand with what ended up happening not that long ago with a very easy, quick search. The truth is revealed in 2021. That original eBay seller with the amazing story told Input Magazine that the Dybbuk box story he told to sell it was entirely fictional. Entirely fictional. Insane. He went to... Such pains to craft very specific details to sell this thing, right? I mean, bravo. It is, it's a good story, though. It really does not look good for the entire possessed item industry, but we are going to keep an open mind here. So let's take a look at some dolls who are notoriously haunted by the demonic. They've got some pretty convincing tales as well. Annabelle is up first as the doll made famous a second time by the Annabelle movies. In the films, the doll is a pretty creeptastic porcelain Victorian looking thing with dead eyes. In real life, Annabelle is a raggedy Ann doll. I had one of these grown up. 
In one sense, I wonder if the story is made even darker because of the innocence or nostalgia that this particular doll can represent for so many. And actually, according to the doll's creator, John Barton Gruel, Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy's tales were specifically designed for children aged 4 to 10 and were intended to contain nothing to cause fright, suggest fear, glorify mischief, excuse malice, or condone cruelty. I know pairing evil with the purest of innocence is an overused trope, but it certainly worked for folks in the 70s at the height of the Warrens' expeditions and investigations, and specifically when they made the safest and best possible choice they could to remove the considerably demonically possessed doll from its owners at the time and place it inside of a blessed case in their museum. According to the Warrens, Annabelle was responsible for two near-fatal experiences, an actual fatality, and a string of demonic activities that took place over the course of about 30 years. In 1970, a 28-year-old nurse named Donna received this doll as a gift from her mother. She would bring it home to her apartment that she shared with another nurse named Angie. Donna sat the adorable doll on the sofa in the living room, displaying it to anyone who would walk through the door, or she would sit it upright on her bed. However, it wouldn't be long before the roommates noticed something strange. The doll seemed to be changing positions and moving around when they weren't there. At first, these occurrences seemed like nothing and were brushed off. But one day, Donna left the doll sitting on the sofa and went to work, only to come home to find her in a different room. Depending on the story you read, it was at this point that Angie's fiancé, Lou, would confess to the girls that the doll gave him bad vibes and encouraged Donna to get rid of it. Not long after this, Donna and Angie claimed that they then started finding handwritten notes all over the apartment. The notes read, help us, and also help Lou. What was strange about this, aside from finding serial killer notes randomly throughout their place, was that the notes were written on parchment paper. Neither lady knew where it had come from as they didn't keep it in their home. No actions were taken at this point. It's unclear if they yet linked the notes to the doll or just didn't know what to think. It wasn't until they found what appeared to be blood on the doll's hands that they freaked out enough and considered the situation properly haunted enough to call in a medium. A seance was held where the medium discovered that the doll was inhabited by the spirit of a seven-year-old girl named Annabelle Higgins, whose body had been found on the site where the current apartment had been built. According to the medium, Annabelle was benevolent and just wanted some love and affection. The nurses agreed to caring for Annabelle and making her feel welcome and consented to allow her to reside with them and to continue taking up residence in the doll. So if this really was a real infestation or possession of the object, bad choice on Donna's part for giving over all permission to the entity to remain. But... We really cannot fault her and we cannot fault the medium. If we're talking true demonic activity here and demons are as horrific and malicious and manipulative as people say they are, they can trick anyone into believing them, right? Yes. So, following the seance, the activity kicked up, actually. Lou was staying over at the girls' apartment one night to awake in a state of sleep paralysis and watch as Annabelle crawled on top of him and started to strangle him. We've talked in depth about sleep paralysis before. That would be absolutely terrifying. The next event to take place and the nail in the coffin for old Annabelle would take place one day when Donna was out. Lou and Angie heard some noises coming from her room, and upon going in to investigate, they found nothing out of place, no signs of intrusion, just Annabelle lying face down on the ground. As Lou approached her, he suddenly doubled over, feeling searing pain through his chest, His shirt immediately soaked through with blood, and when they looked, his chest had long, bloody claw marks raked across it. Sorry, Lou, but if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Following this incident, Donna promptly called a priest, who then directed them to Ed and Lorraine Warren. Upon investigating the situation, the Warrens concluded the doll was not possessed by some spirit, but rather being manipulated by a demonic entity. Donna, now realizing the gravity of the situation, asked the Warrens to remove the doll. And they did. 
For anyone curious about the near-death and fatal encounters with Annabelle, as the Warrens were transporting Annabelle back to their home, their car kept swerving suddenly and the brakes would randomly fail. I am assuming they are taking Lou's almost strangulation into account for the other close call encounter. And according to the Warrens, there once was a young man who visited their museum with his girlfriend on their way through. They were on a motorcycle on tour. The young man tapped and taunted Annabelle through her blessed glass, telling her to do her worst and to put scratches on him like she had done to Lou. Ed kicked him out of the museum at that point. Supposedly, within a few hours, the young man lost control of his bike and ran it right into a tree, killing him. His girlfriend would survive, but be in a hospital for over a year. That is the story, anyway. All right. Up next is a really intriguing case of a demonically possessed doll named Annie. And what is so intriguing about this story, at least to me, is that the owner, Matt Tillett, who is a paranormal investigator, full well knows she may be demonically possessed and uses the energy she stirs up on his various investigations. According to the Daily Post, Annie is believed to be possessed by two malevolent beings that her owner says help to bring forward spirits and various activity. Matt has been investigating with Annie for a while and has her outfitted with different paranormal equipment, which he says he hopes will help to prove that there is life after death. When she's not gallivanting around town with her handler, Annie is put back into her box. A very strange twist on this already strange friggin' story is that Matt said everything was going just fine with his little devilish counterpart, but at around the first year mark, the doll suddenly started to cry. Starting around mid to late 2020, Annie started to cry real tears. And for no reason, according to Matt. He says it started happening since he put her in her new enclosure, something akin to the Warren's glass case for Annabelle. Annie now sits, staring weepy-eyed out her little mime's nightmare, and cries. Demonologists that Matt has sent her to have suggested it could be one of the actual demons crying because they are trapped inside of that box and can't get out, which says to me that that case has also been blessed like the Warrens, which says to me that maybe there was more activity happening around Matt's home that he was withholding because of the benefits he was receiving of having Annie on his investigations, but also it scared him and necessitated a more secure setup so he could, you know, sleep without thinking he was about to be murdered. I don't know. The train's a thought, man. Just, just a theory. Just a theory. An article posted just last month covering this guy and his doll added a few juicy details I hadn't seen anywhere else. They may be changing the story or just adding to it, so take them for what they're worth. According to this new article, the tears that she cries are acidic in nature. Matt says in the article, that's how he knows it's the attachment's actual emotions because demons cry acidic tears. Not sure how he knows that, but all right. She also tries to light herself on fire. No beggy. Matt keeps her under 24-hour surveillance, under lock and key, because of this attempt. I'm suddenly starting to feel very bad for this doll. The story is feeling very weird for me. Her backstory actually gets a moment in the spotlight, too. Apparently, Annie was originally rescued from the remains of a house fire that took the lives of the original owners. Matt found her and her backstory intriguing and would buy and win her in an auction. He says the previous owners will often show up next to the doll in images taken of her, showing that they are still attached to her. He thinks that since these previous owners are still attached, they haven't accepted that they have actually died, and because the doll's tears are acidic, that makes the original owners the demons. I'm not... I, I was never really all that good at math growing up. And this really feels like one of those word math problems, you know, like 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 how many apples he got left if Jim takes all the oranges or or it's genius. It all hinges on that acid tears equals demons thing, though. So last all we're going to cover is one named Peggy, because, of course, it's Peggy. 
What's going to make her a little different than the other two we've discussed is that she isn't thought to be possessed by a demon, specifically. Many psychics who are familiar with her case agree that it is indeed a malevolent force possessing her and that she may have possible ties to the Holocaust. A British article that details out some of her history and lore refers to an impish creature doing the possessing. The reason I'm including her is in case there ends up being at least a connection between separate entity classes and the demonic. That's not my original impulse and not a direction I'm heavily leaning, but I do want to clear room in order to make a case for that. Her most recent previous owner, Jane Harris, and her group actually deduced that Peggy is simply possessed by a human spirit. They think she is a British woman born in 1946 who ended up dying from some sort of chest condition. So, Peggy, just as her name is imbued, is an incredibly average, innocent-looking doll. No acid tear streaks, no blank black eye holes. She's your stereotypical girly doll with a blonde bob. But according to her track record and to the hundreds of people who dared to so much as look at a photo of her online and suffered for it, Peggy got a dark streak. Ms. Harris, who is a paranormal investigator out of Britain and runs an organization called Haunted Dolls, had Peggy in her possession for two straight years before handing her over to her new owner. She originally came to obtain Peggy after she received an email from the then-current owner asking Jane for her help. That original owner claimed that Peggy was causing some pretty haunting nightmares for her. She would awaken in the middle of the night, hot and shaking, She called in two priests to help either to bless the space, the doll, or just to pray, but to no avail, the woman would go on to become quite ill and begin suffering from fever and ultimately hallucinations before finally locating Ms. Harris's website online and reaching out. And since Harris revealed this doll to the world, tons of folks have come forward claiming accounts of having been affected or tormented by merely looking at her photo— ranging from the creepiness of their light bulbs blowing out and the feeling of a presence in their homes after simply mentioning Peggy's name, to full-on physical afflictions such as nausea, chest pains, crippling migraines, flashing visions of abusive treatment, overwhelming anxiety, and horrifying nightmares. One woman who reported the doll having an effect on her claimed that she suffered a heart attack shortly after watching a video of Jane together with Peggy in a car. An eerie part to this particular haunting, which we might have seen a little bit with Annabelle and the motorcyclist, but Ms. Harris previously claimed that it's not only while people are looking at her or watching her that these things seem to take place. It seems to be afterwards, too, which is unsettling. Peggy now resides in her new home as one of the all-star attractions at Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. Zach's getting a lot of unintended free advertising out of me today. Zach says he was skeptical of the doll and the purported activities surrounding her at first. That was until she caused some terrifying activity to occur at the time he was filming an episode of Deadly Possessions with her. He claims Peggy manifested a large amount of black flies that came out of nowhere and swarmed him. She caused the camera to malfunction. She also caused negative mental effects on Zach and also poltergeist activity. It's them quiet, normal-looking ones you gotta watch out for. Let's switch gears here in the final quarter and discuss the types of objects that can typically become possessed and what a person should do if they find themselves in possession of one. Because sometimes you don't know, right? Collectors of antiques, thrift store shoppers. So I recently had someone comment on a post I did of the Dybbuk box with a, a, a little bit of pushback. And then they they went to post something completely unnecessary on their personal page, which I saw because we follow each other and I pay goddamn attention. Don't be a butthead. Now, look, I knew when I posted it that ultimately the story had already been outed as a hoax. Of course, it takes but a simple Google search. Dybbuk box real? But I left my post a little more open-ended than that. The reason I did so... While it does help if you are trying to craft some kind of buildup to your actual episode to leave it open to discussion, you know, marketing basics, personally, 
I want to remain completely open to the concept that if possession is a real thing and if, let's say, entities can possess or at the very least become attached to inanimate objects such as a doll, then why not an antique wine cabinet? Why not? Why not? Why not, why not a stinky old boot? Hmm? A bag of marbles. Because this is the point I'm trying to make here. Those are all just possible vessels or points of attachment. It is a widely held line of thinking that objects can carry spiritual energy or have entity attachments. Any item can be capable of being infested. Why? Because any location can too. If you are willing to suspend your belief to the point that the abandoned FedEx out on 56 is haunted by old Prospector Willie, then I don't think you get to shut down the possibility that a spirit could be hanging around because you now wear their wedding ring that they wore when they were married to the love of their life, or for an extremely high energy or traumatic event imprinting on an item. Or that a malevolent entity, for the sake of argument, let's say it's a demon, can be chillin' inside a nasty old box. Nuff said. Mirrors are especially wrapped up in the supernatural and are so, from what I've learned, because they are especially wrapped up in our superstitions. Been that way for centuries. The Romans believed that any reflective surface was a reflection of the human soul and should not be misused or abused, or misfortune would befall the person and they risked losing their soul. They also believed one could accidentally get their soul trapped in the mirror. An old superstition is that of covering mirrors after a person has died so that if their soul should wander around, they don't get trapped inside one. And it's also important for the living as it is largely believed that demons are attracted to tragedy and can come through the mirror after a funeral or during the wake. Many cultures and belief systems around the world believe that mirrors are portals to other worlds, other dimensions. You can use them to predict the future, to see and communicate with the other side. So, yeah, there is something innately magical and mystical about the mirror. And there is something innately creepy about them, too, right? Mirrors reflect reality. But by nature, the reality contained within them isn't real acting much like a virtual reality or plane. And there's an actual phobia associated with the staring at one's own reflection that ties into this idea. Things start getting a little strange and spooky the longer you stare into a reflection, you know? You guys ever do that? Just stared into your own eyes for any length of time? It can absolutely be really unsettling. Those in the know say you should be wary when bringing a previously used mirror into your residence. There is a story from 2013 of two roommates in London who found a mirror outside their apartment next to a dumpster. They were like, this is tight, son, and they took it inside. Things immediately started happening, such as one of the boys waking up in the middle of the night with shooting pains through his whole body. The other suddenly became extremely lethargic and depressed, which was reportedly way out of character for him. They didn't connect it right away to the new mirror that they brought in. But then things got worse after one of the boys decided to paint the frame. Things began to go missing around the flat. And then after one of them started to see shadow figures and shapes moving in the reflection of the mirror while no movement was taking place in the actual room, they then put two and two together and decided it was probably on the safer side to just get rid of the damn thing. Once they did, they claimed their lives returned to normal probably just a coincidence. There have been numerous other stories of mirrors with supposed malevolent attachments and possessions, with side effects ranging from people and pets getting sick, mysterious aches and pains, items go missing, spells of bad luck, and even all the way to seeing figures, or yes, demons, crawling out of them. Remember the Long Island haunting a few episodes back? That, that's what the daughter said she saw. Now here is some science to keep in mind. It is something called the Caputo effect, which I did touch on just a moment ago, but let's go into this for the sake of argument that mirrors cannot be possessed and it's all in our mind. In 2010, researcher Giovanni Caputo found that when people stare at their own reflections in a dimly lit room for an extended period of time, they start to experience an illusion, trick of the eyes and the brain. In less than a minute, people started to see other faces. 
and they saw their own faces, but distorted. And they would also see monstrous beings within the mirror. Caputo noted that these other faces often took the form of an archetype, such as the old witchy woman, the young girl, etc. According to Caputo, because of this, there is a chance that both you and someone separate from you, both staring at the same mirror, could conceivably see the same figure or face inside of it. Hence, the urban legend is born. I shall include the article I got this information from. They link to the actual experiment. Check it out. Uh, to wrap up mirrors, though, I'm, I'm kind of on the side that since they are already so wrapped up in centuries of superstition and then the weird tricks they can play on our eyes, our brains, and our own personal expectation effect, you know, I, I cannot comment one way or the other right now on their potential for demonic possession, but I would still probably proceed with caution, as with anything. As we mentioned previously, dolls are notorious for being demonic vessels. I think we've covered that one pretty well today. Dybbuk boxes. If there are any out there actually housing a demonic entity, I, I think they are few and far between, just as the original poster of that original Dybbuk box found success in relieving himself of his item for sale, there is now an entire online industry devoted to the sale of haunted items, especially dolls and Dybbuk boxes because they are so widely known. So again, keep the open mind. If you can believe that an inanimate object or location can be possessed, well, then a Dybbuk box can be possessed as well. But if you're a collector of haunted items specifically, be wary that peeps be trying to make a quick buck. Furniture can be possessed. The Devil's Rocking Chair is a pretty well-known case, of course. Famously owned by Zach Baggins. Hmm. Starting to see a theme here. And with a name like the Devil's Rocking Chair, the stage is already kind of set, isn't it? No matter the name. The chair's reputation does precede it. It was famously the site of the exorcism of an 11-year-old David Glatzel, who reportedly was possessed by a demon. The exorcism was performed by numerous priests conducting the rites. Ed and Lorraine Warren had been contacted by this time and were performing the official investigation. So the story goes, they were able to exorcise this beast from Glatzel, which promptly entered and possessed another person, Arnie Johnson, who it is claimed challenged the entity to leave David and take him instead. Arnie Johnson would later kill his landlord, and during his trial, he, the Warrens, his family, and his attorney would try to use the argument of demonic possession at the time of the murder as the basis of his defense. The chair has also caused excruciating back pain in some folks who have dared to sit in it, and others claim to have seen the beast itself sitting in it. As of 2019, Zach Baggins actually officially closed this specific exhibit down following some adverse reactions from multiple patrons upon entering the area of the chair and a frightening encounter Zach says he himself experienced with a friend back at his own house. Now, in 2021, the brother of David Glatzel, Carl, told the Hartford Current that his brother had never been possessed, that this story was exploitation for monetary gain by the author who would go on to write the book about it and the Warrens, and that the real horror story is the damage this 40-year-long hoax has done to his family. And that's incredibly heartbreaking to think that that is what has taken place here. And no matter the legend and details of the paranormal side of this case, you've got to be willing to listen when one of the actual family members who went through this, who by all accounts is just trying to live their life, trying to move on with their life, is telling you, look, it just didn't happen like this. This isn't true. Carl told The Current that the account written about in The Devil in Connecticut, that's the book, that it has ruined relationships and career opportunities for him. But as of last year, he was working with a professional author on a book of the true account of what actually happened all those years ago. So hopefully we will all see that come out soon. All right, for the final section, let's talk about you guys. Do you really need to be wary when you pick up that cool vintage side table at the flea market or the sapphire ring from the pop-up antique fair? Do you need to be careful bringing those secondhand items into your home? Many in the paranormal field, especially those who work with energy, will tell you yes. Objects hold energy. 
and that can be good or negative energy. They will also tell you that negative attachments are quite real and can really cause you some grief if you do not properly cleanse. So first things first, just be aware that you could be bringing at best some ride-along energy or entity into your home and at worst, a negative force or entity. I don't see a ton of New Age witches and energy and light workers even mention the word demon, which is nice. And the thought that occurs to me again, are people mistaking the demon? Are they experiencing a negative force or entity during these encounters? Not a devil, but something else, something less frightening, far less powerful or evil. If you find yourself in the situation of having brought something back with you, never fear. You can actually handle this all on your own. There are many, many, many ways to cleanse an object. The most well-known way to do so is smudging. About 80% of New Age spiritualists seem to bite your head off if you mention smudging with sage because it's not authentic or something like that from what I have heard if the intention is there, if you are exuding positivity in, negativity out, baby, you're golden. But yes, feel free to smudge with sage or cedar stick is another popular burn. Another simple way to cleanse is via moonlight or sunlight. You simply set the object out in either and you ask that it be cleansed. And I know a ton of people who personally rejoice any time sea salt is involved in any spiritual task. Sea salt is a fantastic eradicator of negative and dark energies. There are different salting techniques, so I shall leave it to you to Google the one that fits your situation the best. And the final way I'm mentioning is actually my personal favorite, crystals. I have a personal collection of crystals and stones. I have been collecting for almost a decade and get embarrassingly excited when I happen onto something I don't already have. When I, you know, go into a random market or thrift shop or whatever. Uh, one of my favorites to use for clearing negative energy is my black tourmaline. I will tell you, just like with anything, I think it all comes down to intention. I go through phases, too, where I look at my collection and I see a bunch of pretty rocks. That's it. Rocks. And there are times, too, that they feel different. They exude an energy and I use them to guide my focus and intention when I really need something more, you know, like almost like a prayer stone or something. Now, if you think you have brought home something darker and you have tried to clear it on your own via any of the methods I've just laid out. Nobody says you can't call in a professional. If your gut is telling you, uh, I, th I think I need a, a priest, you know, to come bless my space and the new ottoman, then do that. That is fine. And after that, should you still be feeling something isn't right, that there is a dark presence much darker than usual lurking just around the corner and you're seeing shadowy beings crawling all over the place and you're plagued by your worst nightmare of all nightmares night after night and you get sick and your pet gets sick in short if you feel like you actually have a demonically possessed possession your only solution might be to call Zach Baggins. That's going to do it for today, folks. If you want to add your two cents to this interesting aspect of the demonic, please do so. Be nice. Be fair. But please do so. Catch me over on IG, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. On all of them, just search the handle at ParanormGirlPod or email the show at ParanormGirlPod at gmail.com. Hey, if you are loving the show in any sense, you like the education or my velvety, smoky blue voice or the fascinating guests, or even if you're just lost and don't know how to technology and find any other shows on the podcast platform you are currently using, hey, while you're here, why don't you give me a little happy rating and make my day? No, that, that right there, your clicks of a thumb to screen, that right there will be the best birthday gift a girl could ask for, which is coming up here, by the way. And I know originally I asked you all to share this show with someone you love or hate, and you should still do that. But lovely ratings are sincerely 
the gift that just keeps on giving. It's the way you tell total strangers over the internet why they too should listen to the Paranorm Girl podcast. Okay, all done. Time for your final note. Y'all, these are really good, like, campfire tales, right? That's the overwhelming sense that I get from this episode. And, and, you know, looking back over it, tales meant to strike fear and wonder, exaggerated and expanded and added to, you know, a little doubt sewn in here and there. Leaves the listener not really knowing where to stand with all of this. I think I'm going to lean more toward how I felt about possession in the last lesson episode that even though I'm not entirely convinced of possession by evil spirits, I'm still willing to look and learn more. Until something convinces me either way. And just like I said back on the location infestation episode, the feeling that there might be something more taking place here does not necessarily mean a demonic force is evident. I'm so curious where you all land on this one. Personally, I feel like I'm changing. There was definitely some underlying internal fears I was holding when I first began this research. But after the strip search of a season this has been so far, like we boiling demons down to their bones, does anyone else feel the fear like dissipating? I don't know, it's just not the same. I'm not scared right now, in the slightest. And I'm seeing things through new eyes. I'm rejuvenated in my way of thinking about this subject, and it's cool, man. I'm so glad that we did this. How about you guys? I I know I have listeners of all walks and faiths and levels of belief, and I respect that about you guys. I do. You know, I never get to this point in the season where I begin addressing this research and where it has brought us without thinking about those of you who I regularly hear from. Your stories and experiences are so important to me, and I take each and every one into consideration, without a doubt. My ideas have certainly changed and been redefined since we started this. Let me know if that's been the case for you as well. Next week, I have another incredible conversation coming up with my bud and fellow podcaster. I will be talking with Mike from Extreme Paranormal Podcast, who has had quite the paranormal life and stories to share. So really looking forward to that. He is a great dude, has a voice meant for broadcast, and uh, I know y'all will dig it. And I've also got some surprises and a few very exciting announcements I will be making over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for those. Thank you for listening, you guys, and hanging in there for this longer than usual episode. Y'all are the best. Until we meet again, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.